So here's a video on Prudhoe Bay. There's a little bit of a, I got a storyline to go in by, like kind of the Balfort Sea, Prudhoe Bay, the start, the end, the middle, everything in between. So I've had a, I threw in a small video here in the beginning so you kind of know how it started. And then there's some middle stuff. And then I had a bunch of these pictures that I've had since I was probably seven or eight years old about the uh, offshore drilling rigs and the ice, the tugboats, the barges, yada yada, and all that stuff. So I just made a video, kind of how it all goes down. Since the first discovery of oil in 1968, Atlantic Richfield Company's operating area at Prudhoe Bay has been the scene of an ongoing adventure. Oil men and their rigs are part of a massive operation designed to tap some 10 billion barrels of oil locked in a natural reservoir beneath the Arctic tundra. To meet the pipeline completion date, summer 1977, thousands of tons of equipment must be hauled here over long distances. Here in Seattle, Tacoma, a major industrial complex was being constructed for transport to Prudhoe Bay. Built in interlocking sections called modules, each unit will be self-contained, a fully equipped flow station or gas injection plant or fuel processing system. Hauling the giant modules onto the barges becomes a delicate operation. Every factor of weight and balance minutely calculated to prevent mishaps. From the dock, they are moved onto ocean-going barges the size of a football field. Timing is critical. The barges must reach a point southwest of Barrow no later than the end of July. Only then does the Arctic ice pack move offshore sufficiently to allow normal passage of sea traffic to the North Slope. The voyage from Puget Sound to Prudhoe Bay is expected to last a month an unpredictable journey along 4,000 miles of open sea, whipped by high winds, sudden swells and crippling fog. Under a shroud of heavy mist, the convoy navigates through the Bering Straits, the first major obstacle in a journey that so far has been uneventful, even calm. Moving north and further east towards Point Barrow, the barges and their tugs encounter an impenetrable fortress of ice. The harsh predictions have become reality. Meanwhile, at Prudhoe Bay, Atlantic Richfield's preparations continue around the clock. For simply moving gravel for highways, the men of Prudhoe Bay are heirs to a tradition of Arctic exploration begun in the last century by Perry and Frobisher. Searching for oil may seem less romantic than racing to the pole by dog sled, but the potential for mankind is no less impressive. Suddenly, in late August, the unanticipated fury of an Arctic storm lashes out at the barges trapped off Wainwright. One of them, crushed by the force of the ice pack, sinks. In a determined rescue operation, the barge and its precious cargo is saved. An unloading dock is formed by sinking a special barge at the tip of a causeway jutting out from shore. Along the 4,000-foot causeway, the modules will be moved. To Valdez, a juncture for sea and land transport, one of the barges sent back from the Arctic already has arrived. Oversized trucks will now carry a vital load north to Prudhoe Bay. Giant beams and girders for bridges to span one of the many rivers coursing through the Arctic. So large are these vehicles and their cargo that all roads north have been cleared by government direction to enable them to pass. Then in late September, when all seemed lost, nature again releases her hold on the vessels blocked at Barrow. Led by Coast Guard icebreakers, moving like flagships triumphant in battle, the 15 barge fleet sails through fresh channels toward Brudo Bay. As tugboat bows and whirling propellers help clear the surface ice. 
maneuvered into favorable unloading positions by the skillful tugboat skippers and their crews. The barges must be offloaded soon after arrival, a race against the impending threat of winter. Soon after the successful breakthrough, nature reasserts her power over man. As the storm rages, the barges yet to be unloaded become entombed in clutching ice. But on the land, man retains control. Though temperatures fall rapidly and wind velocity increases, the movement of the modules to their final destination continues. Shrouded in protective canvas, they are carried by the giant crawlers to the oil facility site. Night falls early. Soon there will be no daylight at all. But there can be no let up in setting up the modules. They are the heartbeat of an operation which, when completed, will help send two million barrels a day flowing to what Alaskans call the lower 48. In the near future, Prudhoe Bay, the largest reservoir yet discovered on the North American continent, will provide nearly 10% of the oil consumed in the United States. No less pioneers than their forebears, the truckers of the far north must challenge one of the world's most hostile environments. Leaving Fairbanks, the trucks begin their journey north. Through an inhospitable land, they travel the last leg of a journey roughly equal to two-thirds the width of the United States. They cross mountain passes that rise to 8,000 feet on wind-battered highways that, with scant warning, can be whipped by winter storms. Reaching the Dietrich Pass in the Brooks Range, the truckers come to one of the great natural barriers to the Northland. Once over the mountains, they will enter the sprawling, endless monotony of the Arctic Plain. Across this barren land, a life-supporting pipeline is being constructed. When completed, the Trans-Alaskan oil line will stretch 800 miles from Prudhoe Bay to Valdez, supplying energy necessary for America. Far above the Arctic Circle, Prudhoe Bay now lies enveloped in around-the-clock darkness. The mass trucks, which have arrived from Fairbanks, stand as silent testaments to man's perseverance and energy. All the equipment transferred from the barges, 3,500 truckloads, will make it through to ensure a bustling on-schedule winter at Prudhoe Bay. As long as weather permits, the flow of huge cargo trucks goes on uninterruptedly. Winter temperatures may fall to 60 below, and assembling flow lines must be performed inside a mobile welding hut. These pipes, when joined, will be part of an extensive gathering system drawing oil from the ground, separating it from intermixed gas and water, and speeding it to the main pipeline. Welded together, these 34-inch steel sections are eased through a window to meet the other parts of the line. Winter tightens its grip, and the shallow waters of the bay turn to ice. But the silent tugs sit safely out of its reach. and equipment are heavily insulated to withstand gusts up to 100 miles per hour and temperatures unimaginably cold. Officials are taking no chances. Self-generating heating units are carried to the barges to provide further protection against the extreme Arctic winter and to activate some of the priceless machinery within the modules so as to prevent their deterioration through disuse. Trapped off Prudhoe, helpless in unmoving ice six feet thick, the barges must wait until the spring 
when nature's cycle repeats its timeless pattern and the ice begins to break. Until then, there is nothing man can do to free the vessels. But the modules they carry must and will be moved ashore. Powerful cutting machines are put into operation to clear a path through the ice for a gravel causeway which will extend nearly a mile out to sea. Constructing the causeway required special permission from the state of Alaska and the U.S. Corps of Engineers. The combined might of men and machines attack the strangulating ice. Within a month, the causeway will be completed. Assurance that a crucial project will now be maintained on schedule. Fitting himself against nature, man has beaten the odds. of winter, the causeway moves steadily closer to the silent, towering monoliths. Soon the modules will be hauled onto shore, set into the Arctic landscape, permanent monuments to man's ingenuity and spirit. Shit, that makes me cold just watching that. I couldn't imagine having to work in the conditions, but like always, I'm from the north. It's not as bad as it looks. You gotta be able to be prepared for the wind, though. Cold. So you can see here the Alaskan pipeline is built above ground and it's uh, built to design so it can move. There's permafrost six feet under the ground. The frost stays there all year long so they had to build a special pipeline to adapt to the constantly moving terrain and that was kind of the biggest thing was we don't want any blowing up pipelines and leaking oil all over God's country. The biggest problem was that the, uh, the natives were really concerned about the migration of the caribou. They like to jump back and forth even when it gets cold just like the rest of us they'll go to warmer climates yada yada back and forth so they're really concerned about building this pipeline all the way across for 800 miles that the caribou weren't going to be able to cross and go across it. I remember we talked about it quite extensively and it was a big ordeal. We talked about it in socials class and all sorts of stuff. We had meetings at schools, yada yada yada. Coming up next on the list, we have the colic. This was a round drill barge. Colic was an ice strengthened drill barge that was used for ice exploration in the Arctic. Gulf of Canada had purchased it first off the hop when it was fresh and brand new. Engineered in Japan, 1983. It operated in Canadian Arctic until 1993, when she was mothballed for over a decade, just sitting idle. In 2005, she was purchased by the Royal Dutch Shell for drilling operations off the North Slope in Alaska. Operating in Alaska until 2012 when she was being towed back to her Seattle resting grounds to skip on paying taxes, supposedly. Uh, the barge and the tug endured some heavy winter storms and so much heavy wind that the tug was fighting full throttle to keep to keep the drilling barge off the rocks and uh, eventually the tow line snapped they uh, reattached and tried to hold it hold it hold it till it didn't break off and then eventually just gave up and it ended up on the rocks after engine failure so it was on the rocks and then it wasn't until after that 
<sighs> they pulled it from the rocks and took it to a scrapyard basically in 2014. They were gonna repair it, but it was gonna cost too much. many different styles of like drilling barges. The colic was a floating barge and it would anchor down with eight anchors which is crazy. And then uh, we have the KCN which was like a concrete uh, platforms that would be put around. They were floated where the concrete would float in the ocean but the floor was only like Designed to drill in like 30 meters of water, so the KCN would be your circle around the rig and would be filled with seawater or sand anchored down. Then they would fill in from the top with gravel, sand, which it's the Arctic, so it, it's like concrete once it's frozen, and then they put the rig on top of that. The other style is they would dredge up and make man made islands. and then bring all the rigging stuff by, f by float, barge, whatever, and just put everything on top, as you can see. And the craziest part about it is that the ice would come along all the time. The Arctic ice float would come by the rig and it would just pile up and pile up. This was the biggest thing to overcome because this ice would just come full force. So they. They only had a small window of like 125 days a year if you didn't want to deal with the ice. So they were trying to design a way where they could uh, drill 365 days a year, obviously. So this was uh, the three different ways they did it. The colic itself was uh, designed round because it thought it would deflect the ice a little bit better. So it was the only one kind of like it. The rest of them had the walls built up at like a 30 degree angle to shield it from the ice. Another weird fact that I found out that uh, the Cassian, um even though it was the des design and built by an uh, oil company in the beginning and it ended up being in the possession of Arctic Transport which is the orange and white which is the company my, my dad worked for in the 80s in Edmonton which is really weird. So there's more to this story and as I dig I find. One more style that they had is they would bring in water pumps and they would pump water up and they would layer, layer, and layer, just like we build ice roads. And they would bring the whole rig out onto the ice after building like this ice road of thick ice, load by load, out into the Arctic, onto this ice platform that they had spray built over a couple of weeks, a month. A drilling platform and then just put the rig right on top of the ice. <music> then you had these tugboats. The tugboats were kind of like the bed trucks of the ocean. They had massive winches, huge tug lines, and if they weren't tugging, and these were mostly like uh, Canadian Coast Guard ships, they would be driving around just smashing the ice, as was their job, just to cruise around and hit stuff. Which is why I become a bed truck operator in the first place, because I like to hit shit. Most of these ships are still in service today. These are built from the 80s. Yet again, another Japanese boat manufacturer, because we all know the best stuff comes from Japan. And uh, they are now still in service in Russia in their offshore drilling operations.